let's do uh, mobile DevOps with uh, Mohammed. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so let's get into it. Today I am going to be uh, going over mobile DevOps uh, and hopefully at the end presenting a CI CD branching workflow for mobile apps. Uh, so what are we going to cover today? Uh, unfortunately, Matt already covered this, so I might be being a bit redundant, but what is DevOps? <laughs> classic, classic mistake. Uh, and then afterwards, we're going to jump into why is it important for mobile development. Uh, there's a lot of challenges in mobile DevOps, so we're going to go over that together. And then we're going to just shift completely and go to ephemeral preview deployments in CI CD. Sounds fancy, it's not. Uh, Cool, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Mo Javad. Cool. My name is Mo Javad Kazali. Very, very long Middle Eastern name. Uh, I actually shortened it from Mohammed Javad Kazali, so uh, there we go, save some syllables. Uh, I am the head of mobile at Theodo UK. So Theodo is a global consultancy with over 600-ish digital experts uh, across the UK, US, Morocco and France. Uh, we basically help build different types of apps, web apps, mobile apps, uh, trying to solve like different problems, whether they be things like uh, retail or uh, building like self-checkout tills or building like a chatbot for a fintech company. So quite a range. Uh, unfortunately, I've got my handle for the app formerly known as Twitter, now called the Elon Musk, Musk app. So uh, if you would like to have a chat, um, please just send me a message. Uh, I'm unfortunately still active there. So. All right, DevOps, what is it? Matt already gave two definitions. I'm just gonna quickly go through these. Again, practices, tools that increase organizations' abilities to deliver stuff in high velocity. Uh, practices, tools, cultural philosophy, let's get a bit more abstract, uh, and trying to integrate software development and IT teams, people working together to build good software at high speeds. Kind of the same, kind of different, it seems like people have different definitions. I really like, uh, so I don't know if you guys seen, seen the uh, Site Reliability Engineering book. It's quite a famous O'Reilly book. Uh, it's a really nice uh, compilation of essays about how Google has uh, dealt with like scaling and running production systems. Uh, it, in the intro, it talks about uh, how previously development teams uh, and IT or ops teams were kind of separate from each other. These two things really didn't muddle. Uh, you had a separate uh, dev team, a separate ops team, uh, and over time, they found that that wasn't actually a very good way of running things. So what you should do is really take the space in between them, merge them together, and you get DevOps. Uh, you've seen this graph already. Uh, basically, it's this continuous flow of you planning, building, testing, deploying, seeing how it works, getting feedback, and then doing the whole loop again. That's really the core and integral part of DevOps. Um, what is the expected result of taking like a DevOps framework and a DevOps mindset? Uh, I'm just gonna go through three. You wanna be able to rapidly deliver. Uh, so whether that means developing quicker or getting stuff out to your users at a faster pace and releasing things to production at a faster pace, that is a key and fundamental goal within DevOps. Uh, reliability, you wanna make sure that your app doesn't have outages or the infrastructure is kind of set into place so it doesn't completely break apart. Uh, and lastly, improved collaboration. Uh, you want to make it easier for people in your teams to collaborate with each other, uh, to give each other feedback, and then uh, ultimately integrate that back into your app and your, uh, your software. So, why is it important for mobile development? So I'm going to go through this hypothetical situation. Uh, presume that you've pushed production, so you've released the latest version of your app, uh, and this is what happens to your users. They open the app, immediately crashes. Not great. Happens more often than you'd think to a lot of big apps. So your users have a natural instinct to go ahead and type away, be very, very angry, and uh, the result is that your app the next day has this on the App Store. And this is actually a really big problem. So uh, a, a famous example of this is uh, American football, not really football, but American football team, Seattle Sounders, they uh, release an app to the App Store uh, and all of a sudden everything just started crashing on startup. And uh, the issue was that they weren't able to release a fix for two weeks. And that app was the way that you as a season ticket holder could go into the stadium. So people were not happy. 
It took a very, very long time, a scale of months, to get the reviews slightly back up from one star. So there's a very, very high risk of making mistakes. Um, so why DevOps is, and I'm going to be bold here, more important on mobile than probably any other platform. Maybe bar like something very serious like aviation or something. The cost of mistakes is really high. So well, if you have like a web app or something like that, uh, there's no source of like authority over the value of your application. Um, you know, there's not like a centralized place where people will go and see like, is this a good app or is this a bad app? Uh, unfortunately, we have app store reviews. And so whenever you're prompted to download an app, let's say from Google or from Apple, uh, you will immediately be shown that app store review. And so that is really the arbiter of value. Um, and, and as your reviews go down, you'll get a lower ranking on the App Store, and that means that it's harder to keep a, keep a hold of customers or acquire new customers. So it has a real material impact to businesses. Um, more importantly, the time to recovery. So uh, the process for resubmitting an update to an App Store is a long and tedious process. Uh, as we kind of like we're talking about with the Seattle Saunders, it took them like two weeks to go from fixing the app to releasing it and getting it out to users. So uh, it is a cumbersome and tedious process. So uh, <clears throat> it could take days. Sometimes if you're lucky, it could take weeks um, if you're unlucky. Uh, and beyond that as well, it's not like the web where if you go to whatever the URL is for your website, uh, it'll be automatically updated. Actually, with this, you have to make sure that users upload or download the latest version of your application. So beyond you releasing a new version of the app, it's actually a struggle to get people to download the latest version of your app. And you'll have users that are using a much, much older, outdated version of your app. So tough challenges. This is where it means that DevOps is really important on mobile. So what are some of the challenges in mobile DevOps? <clears throat> We're going to go through three. Let's start off with continuous integration. So CI. Uh, a really nice way of explaining CI that I've seen uh, is that the goal with CI is that you are able to continuously integrate code back into your main branch. So, uh, and, and when we say continuously, it's not like going away for a month and then coming back and integrating it with the main branch that you have for your develop branch or whatever it is. It's doing it on a daily or weekly basis. So uh, typically what you'll have is a pipeline. Uh, within a CI pipeline, uh, you'll automatically build the latest version of your software. Uh, you'll push code fixes, uh, or you'll automate some tests, uh, do some checks to make sure that it's compatible with your main branch, nothing's gone wrong. Uh, you'll push some code fixes if somebody leaves some comments, and then afterwards it'll rerun the build and the tests, make sure that's compatible, and then once people are happy, you can review it and approve it. In an ideal situation, this is happening multiple times a day, um, and that's why you're continuously integrating. On mobile, uh, running tests is a struggle. Uh, if you have a web app or any piece of software, typically you might have like your tests being run on a CLI. There's not a lot of like different dependencies to actually run your test. Uh, on mobile, you need like a physical device to really reliably test that everything's going well. That's not easy to integrate into a CI. Um, there are some emulators, so you could use like an iOS emulator or an Android emulator issue with that is sometimes there's discrepancies. So you might have tests running on an emulator. It doesn't catch some issues that you might have on an actual app where it's got access to the hardware, the camera, what have you. Um, so test results on emulators can be misleading. Um, let's talk about optimizing for different devices. Uh, and this kind of ties hand to hand with the continuous integration. So, oh, I've really screwed up my slides there. Okay. so. Uh, there's different types of devices that you've got. You've got different OS flavors. You've got different specs and requirements. Uh, so like, there's thousands of different Android types of phones. So uh, how do you ensure that as part of your CI pipeline, you're adequately testing to make sure that it works as well on every single phone that you have there? Virtually impossible. Um, there are tools like AWS Device Farm uh, where you can get a host of different devices, actual physical devices that AWS has in like their cloud infrastructure, uh, and you will run your tests uh, on, these, uh, on these physical devices. You can hook that into your CI. It requires a lot of integration, so it's quite tough to test. Uh, ultimately, what you might have is you have an app running on an iPhone, and it feels like this, but in reality, on an older phone, it kind of feels like this. 
So this is like a whole topic. Like there's there's been a, a, a an entire book that's been written by the folks at Callstack. It's another digital consultancy. Uh, they've uh, released 120 pages of how you should optimize your app for old and legacy phones. I've written an article, so if you're interested, you can scan that QR code and read a little bit about it. Definitely not as thorough, but uh, it gives you a little bit of a an intro to the topic. Cool. So let's jump into continuous deployment, the third challenge. So the idea with continuous deployment is that you want to continuously deliver your code to your users. So that means that you have a way in which you automatically send out the latest version of your app to people that are using it, your customers, your users, what have you. Uh, CD isn't really possible. Um, the reason is these two lovely folks here. Uh, Google Play and the App Store become the blocker that you have. Um, there's no automated way because there's a review process there. They sometimes come back, uh, and people have like some horror stories here where like they didn't get the app. Their app got approved first time around. They then needed to make an update to fix a bug fix, and then it got like a whole slew of errors and saying, "Oh, your app doesn't meet our requirements for the store." So uh, this like completely messes up this whole idea of continuous deployment, uh, which is an integral part of, uh, of having a uh, DevOps uh, workflow. So it's not possible, strictly, strictly speaking. Let's talk about over-the-air updates. So this is a bit of a magical twist on this whole concept. Uh, with some frameworks, you can see a little Atom sign there. We're going to talk about React, which is, I hope most people are aware of. If not, Facebook Meta released React seven, eight years ago. It's a big thing. Look into it in your free time. But with some frameworks, uh, like React Native, which is the native equivalent of React, uh, you can actually do an over-the-air update. Uh, that's because of how React Native is architectured. React Native lets you take applications and build basically in like a JavaScript web development type of way developed native mobile applications. So it's pretty cool and you can build cross-platform apps. Because of it being JS based, what you actually have is that you can like push JS code to your users from afar and it'll update the app, which is pretty cool. Um, this is kind of like Pandora's box though, because you can push almost anything to your users. The risk with that is that uh, if you push too much, Apple will stand in front of you and say, you are being a bad boy, and uh, they'll take your app down, and you'll basically not be able to publish it again. So you need to be very careful with this. Most people in like the React Native space will use uh, over-the-air updates for really critical like bug fixes, because it's not technically disallowed, but if you push new features without informing your users, that is not OK. So uh, this whole idea of over-the-air updates <coughs> saves you from those terrible situations where you've published something bad and you need to get a fix out quickly, uh, and we've seen it being really helpful. So we'll get back into this and we'll tie it back up and see how it's relevant. I've just thrown a bunch of concepts at you. Hopefully it's understandable. Any questions so far? I feel like I've been going at a really fast pace. That's great. I'm just going to drink some water quickly. OK, ephemeral preview deployments. I've got some branches in the background. It'll make sense of it. What are preview deployments? Uh, is, raise your hands up if you are familiar with Vercel. Interesting. Just Matt. For once, I'm a trendsetter. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Vercel is a app hosting platform. Um, if you have a React app that's built on Next.js, which is uh, like a flavor of React, if you will. It's a quite a common technology to build your web apps these days. Uh, Vercel does this really cool thing where basically they market it as you connect it to GitHub and on every single Git push we'll build your app and create like a preview deployment. Uh, and people that are reviewing your app, they can literally go in, click that visit preview button, uh, and they'll get a live version of the code that's been modified. Uh, why is this cool? Because basically on every single pull request you can see what's been changing, make sure that everything's all right, nothing's moved around that shouldn't move around. Uh, it's really cool. Um, it was one of the things that like, the first time I saw it, I was like, whoa, this is amazing. Um, so you see this in a few different places. Um, the idea is that you like, create these preview environments for your app, push up 
the, the version of the code that needs to be checked. Uh, once everyone's happy with it, it's been merged back into main or production or whatever you have, uh, it's completely destroyed. So it's like a small bit of resources that is used to quickly, quickly spin up a preview version of the app for people. Okay, what are the benefits of this? There's shorter feedback cycles between code reviews and functionally checking changes. Basically, it means that as someone is doing a CR, they can quickly also make sure that the app is not functionally not changed. End-to-end -end visibility, you aren't like blind to something happening that you wouldn't expect. Uh, and generally, there's just gonna be fewer regressions as a result being merged into your staging and production environments, any of your SDLC environments. So this is actually quite a common uh, thing now in web development. If you know about Jamstack, like it's basically the de facto way of doing things with Jamstack apps now. Um, Netlify, Vercel, Cloudflare pages, these guys have all been doing preview deployments for a while now. Uh, there's a lot of tools for it on the web. Uh, on like a backend side or like other, so other types of software, if you're not dealing with web apps, you can do this very well with like the age of orchestration or, or containerization. Um, something like Kubernetes lets you really quickly like spin up uh, versions of your app, tear them down. It, it makes it a lot easier. So it's possible thanks to kind of these tools. Uh, so we really felt that we were struggling with this because every time we started a mobile app, it was like, well, we don't have this tool. And it was really annoying to take that out of our dev cycle and our dev workflow. So uh, we took some time and we actually created a version of this uh, called Expo Preview Branches. Um, and so, yeah, we now have it, which is really exciting. So uh, just to give a bit of a, a background on what this is, uh, we mainly use React Native. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a really cool way to make cross-platform apps, uh, build once, Basically, you can take like web developers and build a native mobile app and ship it out to iOS and Android at the same time. You don't need like two separate teams or anything like that. It's a really cool technology. It's growing. It's like backed by Facebook. Your Facebook and Instagram apps are all built on React Native, uh, and it's also uh, being used by big, big players in the uh, industry like Shopify. Uh, so we use this like SDK layer on top of React Native called Expo. Uh, it gives you a bunch of nice development tools and build pipelines and stuff like that. And we've ultimately come up with a pipeline and a GitHub action that looks something like this. So GitHub Actions is a CI CD <coughs> framework that you can use or a platform that you can use. Uh, it's very easy to get like CI CD set up in GitHub. It integrates with your GitHub repos. It's a great tool. Uh, we've built this on GitHub, but it's very easy to replicate on any other CI that you have, whether it be GitLab or what have you. Um, so in our steps, we install the dependencies for Expo and EAS. EAS is Expo Application Services. Uh, it's like a cloud way to build your apps. Uh, and it takes out a lot of those like, issues that I was talking about in terms of can you, do you need an actual device to build your mobile apps and so on and so forth. We generate these preview deployments. After we have actually reviewed the code and merged it back into production, we don't want to keep those preview deployments up because if you keep them up, you're just going to be like wasting resources. So we actually go ahead and clean it up and then we'll deploy our latest merged code back into the main branch, which is our develop branch. So rather than kind of giving you this abstract idea, I'm actually gonna demo it, which is famous last words. Uh, we'll see if it goes well. Um, so I've got my phone here. Let's see how well this goes. <coughs> cool, the mirroring's working, exciting. Okay, so uh, I've got a QR code here. This QR code will uh, do something pretty cool. Uh, it will let me scan it with my phone. And once I scan this with my phone, I get a little uh, thing here saying that you can open it in Expo Go. So we'll go ahead and do that. And once I do that, I actually get a version of my app. So this QR code is for the production version of this basic app that I've created. It's just a demo app. Uh, it says open up AppJS to start working on your app. It's like the template that you get for React Native. So this is a native mobile app. Like this is the equivalent of an app that you would go ahead and download on the App Store. Um, what our GitHub action does is that if you were to go here, I've got like a dummy repo set up here. Uh, I've got a pull request that I created, which was adding some extra text to the screen. Uh, after I've pushed some changes, so we'll look at the changes first. So I've actually added some extra text there. It's saying I'm just going to add some more text here. So you can see the diff here in the code. Uh, what the GitHub action does is it'll automatically build that version of your app and then make a comment on that pull request and say to you, here, your version of your app has been published. Go ahead and scan the QR code 
and see the latest version of the app. So we're going to do that. So I, as if I was reviewing a PR, I can go ahead and open up my camera again and then scan the iOS barcode and you'll see it says open in Expo Go. So let's go ahead and do that. Ah, I just closed that one more time. Cool. So we've opened it with Expo Go and you can actually see the text that I just added in my PR in the code has been actually shown to me inside of the app. Uh, so it's pretty cool. It makes reviewing these things so much more thorough. Uh, we feel like you can actually make sure that nothing's gone wrong in the app. There's no regressions. Uh, this is quite a simple example, but you know, it's really good when you're reviewing complex features. Uh, you've changed like fundamental parts of your app. Maybe you've changed some styles. It'll really showcase that to you. Um, and then once I'm happy with this, and I've decided actually this is good, uh, I'll go ahead and merge it. And what you'll see is that it will trigger a action here to actually go ahead and clean up everything. Uh, so it'll run some stuff, delete the branch, um, and then none of that is gonna be left there uh, to, to waste up my resources in the cloud. Cool? All right. So I've written a little bit about it here. Um, you can scan that QR code if you'd like to understand a little bit more about what this is, how it works. I go in a bit more detail there. So feel free to uh, take a look uh, if you're interested. All right, let's wrap up. Used to have speed there. Uh, so uh, we wanted to touch on these different aspects in terms of the expected results of adapting a DevOps mindset. Uh, we wanted to increase the speed and the delivery of our app. Uh, with this type of thing, we feel more confident to push over the air updates to our users. We feel more comfortable making changes. Uh, so it just overall improves the speed at which we're creating uh, new features and, and making changes to our applications. Uh, in terms of reliability, um, it gives us the option to push things out very quickly. Uh, if we were to mess something out to production, uh, so it gives us the option to really get those fixes in if something were to go wrong uh, without needing to go through that whole process of going through the app stores uh, and uh, waiting for Apple to approve our apps, which can take ages. Uh, and then improved collaboration, you ultimately open up this door to every single PR having it checked with the actual app, functionally reviewed, making sure that nothing's gone wrong, there's no bugs, no regressions, uh, and it, it just opens up to, to another level of reviewing code uh, that's about to be merged. So I think it touches on the, those in, in different capacities. Cool. Uh, been through a lot. Any questions? Well, I'll leave the mic. I'll give it to you. Okay. I'm sorry, first of all, Mo, thank you, brilliant. Um, have we got another radio mic anywhere? They can take this one if you want. Yeah, all right, I'll ferry it. Okay, cool. Any questions anywhere? Go on then, Hamad. Uh, uh, first thing, uh, could you put on your, you know the, uh, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the post you wrote. Uh, okay. What are those, uh, the Which one, the optimizing for old phones uh, or the first one? So I've got. Just on the QR code back, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Cool. This is optimizing for legacy devices. It's React Native specific, but there's like overall fundamentals if you're interested. Okay, next question. Well, yeah, sorry, I'll get out of the way of the QR code. Um, we, we'll put it up again later if anyone's not close enough to get that one. Um, yeah, next question over there. Thank you very much. No worries. My experience of the systems administrator <coughs> Ops, uh, of most things, management, development, test environment. Mm -hmm. The, the, yeah, yeah, sorry. the yeah. concentration seems to be on developing the web portal as a source of good. Okay? Mm -hmm. That will deploy the templates to Kotlin and Swift okay. down to web apps or what? Who do that kind of thing? You know? Now, increasingly, we're having problems, you know, you know integrating the two environments whereby we have the main main development portals, mm -hmm. okay, and the Kotlin and Swift developers. How do you resolve those issues? Uh, just so I, I can make sure I've understood your question correctly, you're saying that you're having difficulty integrating your Swift applications, your iOS applications, and your web applications? Okay. Uh, say use React Native. Um, but it's, it's a bit of a cop-out answer. Um, I, I think um, it's one of those challenges that we see a lot. Uh, People have Swift apps and iOS apps and Android app, uh, and uh, sorry, they have iOS apps, Android apps, and web apps. And what you'll find is that you're managing three different teams. Yeah. That the tech isn't very common. Uh, one of the benefits of 
using something like React Native is that you're still getting a native experience, uh, but you're developing one code base. In fact, you could take it really far and build one app and publish it with React Native. You can build one app and publish it to the web, iOS and Android at the same time. So you'd effectively be managing one code base. Um, it, it, the technology becomes so much more common that uh, you don't need to have these discrepancies. You can build once and ship to all of these different environments. That's one way to get rid of the inconsistencies. Um, but, but it is a challenge, yeah, if you have three different teams to keep the feature parity there and the speed of development the same, it's a tough challenge. And it's probably a question that we want to address with the uh, Staff Engineer book that you were. <laughs> Good link, brilliant. Thank you very much, James. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Does everyone put in the form for the Staff Engineer book? Anyone? Am I taking the book home? No, I don't think so. All right, next question here. Okay, thank you for the uh, for this presentation. Thanks. Very really cool, um, especially the technological part of the most faster iterations, which I think like one of the pillars of DevOps. So uh, my question is, so you're, uh, uh, what about backend? So uh, have you uh, considered uh, ephemeral uh, testing environments for backend and actually change the front end and back end together. I understand it's much uh, more complicated question, mm -hmm. but what's your uh, thoughts on that if you have? That, that's a very good question because I was literally talking to one of my colleagues today about this saying like the, uh, the solution that we have falls flat on its face the moment that you like make breaking changes to your backend environments. Uh, so it's a very like big issue that we have with the solution. Um, Typically, those ones will involve more manual. In the current like workflow that we have, it's a bit more manual of a process. We'll probably merge those in like with some different process and like check it and validate that it works on like a local environment. Uh, I've had it done before where we've spun up like backends using Kubernetes for preview deployments and then uh, torn them down after they've been merged. It's a great way to like test backend changes and like API changes. Uh, we unfortunately haven't implemented it, but it's I think like on a large scale app. Uh, that is running over a period of several years, the investment is definitely worth it. Uh, Kubernetes makes it relatively simple, as Kubernetes, like, as simple as Kubernetes can get. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it is a great um, point, and it's something that we haven't addressed, unfortunately. Thank you. <clears throat> Good answer, anyway. Thank you. Done? Okay, cool. One more? Planet Scale is a, like a really cool um, SaaS database solution for relational databases. Sorry, I don't know what's going on. Could, do yeah. you want to just repeat the question? I don't know if you heard that one. Um, did, did you hear the question, Mo? Can you Do you mind asking that one more time? I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't ask you that one before. Yeah, can we have the question from the back again? I think it was a comment oh, about a comment. using okay. the Planet Scale. Should cool. Okay. Good, good, good. Let's go over here. Exercise. <laughs> good exercise. Good exercise. Yeah, um, yeah, I need it. So after scanning the back of mm -hmm. The app gets loaded on the, on the actual app. Uh, is there any limitations of what can be loaded in relation to the current app you have on your phone? Yeah. And how do we deal with what, how do you guys deal with um, the preview app having more features than the app that you have installed on your phone and you try to preview? I don't know if that makes sense. Like that. Yeah, okay, cool. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <coughs> Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, the way that um, this works is we're actually using a phone client from Expo, which is the, like the, the core um, build technology that this is built on top of. Um, what that has is if you go on your app store right now and search for Expo Go, you can download this dev client. In fact, I was debating whether or not I should ask you guys to download it so you can scan it on your own phones, but then realize you probably would be very suspicious of me asking you to download a random app at the beginning of my talk. Um, but uh, so at the very start, that Expo app comes with some of the very basic SDKs that you need on a mobile phone. Things like camera access, notifications, some like basic functionality. If you went ahead and wanted to like add something like very bespoke native functionality into your app, let's say you wanted to like access some random native part of your app, uh, native part of your phone, what you would need to do is you would need to go through this process of creating what we call a development build. So what that is is that gives you like, the end result of that is an APK file or an iOS uh, development build file. Uh, you can install that on your, on your, on your phone again. Uh, and the same thing will work once again. Uh, it's just every single time that you then add extra native dependencies that requires extra native functionality from your phone, you would need to rebuild that development build, uh, re-download it on your phones, uh, and then it would kind of work the same way as it does now. I suppose a bit of a follow-up question. Sure. So then we have a new app, uh, if, if we choose so to test our app, 
Yes. Is it, is it not kind of going back to the very beginning of the presentation, trying to solve the SEO on building it up? Because as you would build more features on, on your own application, like also the Expo Go app to cover these features, mm -hmm. like the new development um, deletes, uh, cover the new SDKs, etc. So you will need to somehow at least test that another way to produce it in a faster way, in a, in a, in a CXD faster way. I'm not sure I fully understand, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, sure. Maybe let's do that. Yeah, let's do that. I'd love to yeah, hear that. Cool, cool. Let's take that one uh, Cool. Any, one last one? Anyone? We could? Yeah, in the middle there. Sorry, just run that. over. I, I could just do it myself. Well, I need this. So do I. Mm hmm. Device. Um, what if you consider a scenario that this data source operating systems for mobiles, mm -hmm. rather than optimizing each individual app for, for device. Mm -hmm. So optimizing for the operating systems as yes. opposed to, yeah, okay. Yeah, optimizing, uh, standardizing operating, operating systems. Okay. Because there are so many varieties of mm -hmm. varieties. Yeah, I mean, the current, the current situation is, uh, this is, uh, not, not to be an Apple fanboy. Uh, this is an Android problem. Uh, because of the limited number of iOS phones, uh, it's actually quite easy to optimize for iOS. Like 99% of the times, we don't get performance issues on iOS. Apple has their like walled garden. From a development perspective, it makes it much easier because you're optimizing for five to 10 phones that are in support at any given point. Uh, with Android, like you said, there's different uh, versions of the OS uh, there's different flavors of each version of the OS. Uh, some random manufacturer in wherever could make a very, 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 very cheap version of a phone uh, with a bad processor, bad RAM, uh, and then your app just falls flat uh, on the face, even though, again, it works really, really well on the iOS version. Uh, optimizing for Android is the issue. Uh, you mentioned like a unified OS. I don't know if that's like, in general, what if we, would, we were to unify OS's across like all mobile phones, uh, I think that would probably exacerbate the problem because you would then have more variety. Uh, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Big shrug, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, coming from somewhere that also works, so we have mobile apps and you know, I ask, yay, Android. Uh. <laughs> Mo, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you for having me.